Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mildra, and I'll be your gaming monk for the evening. Genres are not discrete categories. I've said this many times, and I feel like I'll say it many times again in the future. I repeat this because there's a mindset that permeates fans of popular media, tabletop games included. There's this idea that genres in storytelling, gameplay, and so on are built with these barriers akin to the Great Wall of China between them, and sets of qualifiers that have to be followed in order to fit in that genre, quote-unquote. This is why there's an irony in a whole generation wanting to make tabletop games like the console RPGs they grew up with, and not quite grasping the idea of genres as a coat of paint to apply on a canvas instead of the canvas itself. Some of the ultimate examples of this disconnect would be the debate on whether Avatar The Last Airbender counts as anime, or whether Final Fantasy XV or XVI count as real Final Fantasy due to a pivot to an action-based design. I'm not here to say what is or isn't, but merely that saying something is or isn't this one thing is a case of not seeing the bigger picture. Today's subject matter, Cloudbreaker Alliance, does not suffer from this problem. The brainchild of CJ Lung, who in full disclosure has been a guest on my show, Cloudbreaker Alliance, or CBA as I'm calling it from now on because I'm not paid by the syllable, styles itself as a counter-apocalypse TTRPG that draws upon a variety of console-style RPGs interpreted into its own style. While I'm covering the playtest here in this Impressions, I feel that there is enough present to run a campaign of reasonable length. Still, since it's technically in development at the time of this recording, I'm labeling this as an Impressions video in case the final product has some significant changes from what I'm covering here. Additionally, the introduction of Cloud Walls as unexplored territory means there's an in-universe reason to fill in the blanks. Kind of reminds me of the Points of Light mindset from that game I'm told I'm supposed to hate, but I don't because the grogs don't pay me. I think one of the things to note right out of the gate is the presence of a setting. Many games that call themselves inspired by console RPGs, or anime-inspired, fall into the same trap that Dungeons & Dragons do. That having a no-man's land of an implied setting, one that's broadly meant to be like games such as SNES-era Final Fantasy, but doesn't design itself to be fully agnostic for setting or genre. If you saw my review on Fabula Ultima, you'll be familiar with this particular conundrum. Cloudbreaker clearly has a setting, and is consistent in the presentation of it through its races and monster design, as well as certain types of items that are, I won't say unique, but part of the identity. The biggest contributor, however, is the inbuilt assumption of player characters. Namely, that they are Cloudbreakers who take on certain missions, and these missions are tied into the game's advancement system, usage of currency, and specialized equipment use. I'm certain that I'll have more to say when the full book comes out, which has the World of Cloudbreaker Alliance. But for now, this alone helps ground so much into what it's trying to do, instead of expecting the table to do all the work with little in the way of guidance. Now moving on, I'd like to note that character creation is an interesting beast. You first pick your race, gaining its benefits, and all of the races are separated into different regions that they can be found in. Some of the names might look familiar, but the description is not going to match the assumption if you're coming in for more litigious takes on high fantasy. Second step is the quirks, which you get two points to put in. These provide narrative benefits that can be upgraded as you advance, so they can play a factor beyond first level. <coughs> Third is your class, where you get one rank in at character creation, of course. Classes are organized into paired disciplines in ranks of eight and have some shared benefits between them. A lot of the derived stats like turn speed, defenses, equipment proficiencies, and so on are determined by your primary class. After that is building equipment. It's worth noting that there's a short list of suggested equipment with each class and how much it costs. Now, aside from costs, the other thing to look out for is item slots for each equipment. Each item takes up either one slot or half of a slot. Now the final part is determining your strength, agility, awareness, and empathy, of which you have seven points to spread across, and your mastery is in one skill and one toolkit. It's certainly unorthodox to do attributes last, but there's a method to the madness. I believe it's done in this manner because of the fact that, unlike many games, these attributes don't cascade into everything else. What would be core attributes in any other game here are only used for skill rolls. They don't factor into toolkits, attacks, spells, and so on. They're independent of each other when calculating the modifiers for given actions. I think this is going to be something that will take some getting used to for certain folks. 
I like the character creation present, but I think that it doesn't truly show off what it can do until you get access to secondary classes, at least in my opinion. I like in this too in how in D&D 5th edition, if you didn't get your subclass at first level, you didn't truly experience it until you got your subclass. It's not as bad as that instance, but it is something to note. That said, there is the linear quadratic issue to a point, since the casting classes do get access to a choice at certain thresholds. It's kind of evened out since casting classes don't get access to maneuvers, but that's two maneuver masteries versus the myriad of attunement slots. Again, it's not as bad as other games, but it's still there. Now moving on to the core mechanics, CBA uses a 2d6 system that is built for aiming high. I will note the only issue I have in the playtest is not having a baseline task rating. Or, if there is one, I didn't see it. I feel that'd be important for GMs needing a baseline outside of combat. Now, speaking of combat, I do note that CBA loves its tokens. The first among these are Spirit Tokens, the game's extra effort system that can be used to give PCs a little boost, or utilize class features that are referred to as Spirit Bursts. The GM has a similar resource with the morale tokens that they can use to make a player's life interesting, but running out of them results in a win. There's also barrier and spell glyph tokens to consider. The former can be used to reduce damage, and the latter can be used to reduce MP cost. The biggest change from the norm in combat, however, is the zone system. This is somewhat akin to grid combat, but the zones are meant to be broad areas shared by allies and enemies, instead of a straight grid in the traditional sense. As a result, things like flanking or line of sight don't exactly work in the same context. It's a kind of middle ground between theater of the mind and grid combat that, once again, as I said in the interview, kind of reminds me of the hex system that was in Wild Arms 4 and 5. Lastly, I will note that CBA does one thing I wish more games did, and that's provide a monster creation system for making your own monsters or converting existing ones. The latter especially more games I wish did this. Monsters are given a danger rating, which is akin to challenge rating on the surface, but manages to avoid the assumptions of a balanced class the way challenge rating does. Instead, one could look at it as utilizing an equivalent combat rating by the PCs as a point budget for building encounters. I do remember this sort of point budgeting thing being used in 4th edition to a point when it came to building monster parties. There's even a separate chapter giving examples of encounter spreads to ease the issue. I certainly appreciate this as a way to get GMs past seeing monsters as individual stat blocks, and seeing how they can interact in a party of sorts. All in all, I find a lot to like in Cloudbreaker. However, this is another one of those paradoxes where I feel veterans will have a harder time than newbies. This is because a lot of the design behaviors that have been ingrained in people's mind, and in full disclosure, that includes me, are not present here. This is a game that's playing by its own rules, not the rules that one is supposed to do because of what came before. This means that long-time players of the bigger names in fantasy gaming will inevitably take issue with its calculations. Of course, the less you come at it with the idea of what you're supposed to do, I think the more you'll get out of it. Stay frosty!